everyone. A warm welcome to our second edition of our Tan Chilean German Tanzanian Legal Talk series. I have to say good morning to the participants in Chile and good afternoon to the participants in Germany and in Tanzania. I am very pleased to welcome you to our second Chilean German Tanzanian Legal Talk. Last year, we started this um, cooperation, this legal talk series, as um, a cooperation between the Heidelberg Center in Germany and the Tanzanian German Center of Eastern African Legal Studies, a cooperation project between uh, the University of Bayreuth and the University of Dar es Salaam and the University of Santiago de Chile. Our aim is to strengthen academic research um, beyond our regional focus so that we can foster this cooperation project on an international basis and framework. This time, we also have a very highly important topic for you because our three presentations today will focus on water resources, on the legal protection and on conflicts. So today we have three speakers, Professor Dr. Robert Omondi Ovino, Simon Schau, and Professor Dr. Pila Moranga. And we are very interested in hearing their presentations. This legal talk series is now the second one, as I told you, and we're looking forward to have it on a regular basis. And I'm very much, um, yeah, I'm very pleased to say that we are in the, um, already on board of preparing the next edition so that we can have it um, on a regular basis, like three times per year. The last talk is the living proof that the research and these cooperation projects in academia have no borders. And uh, this is a very good, a very living proof to see that the academic exchange is um, relevant, not only for some regions, but also internationally. I want uh, to um, say that the Tanzanian German Center for Eastern African Legal Studies for the new people who are from Chile and the people joining us for the first time is a cooperation project and uh, which uh, um, gives scholarships to PhD and LLM scholars who are um, doing their master degree and doctoral degree in um, Eastern African legal studies. So our scholars come from six countries in the East African region, namely Tanzania, Kenya, um, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and also from South Sudan. One of our alumni, Dr. Robert Ovino is also going to present today. He's originally from Kenya. He did his master degree there. And he's also now um, as a multiplier um, educating young scholars in East Africa on Eastern African legal law. I want to thank everyone who's involved in this legal talk series, especially the speakers, the moderator, and last but not least, all the participants attending the legal talk from different parts of the world. I wish you a very interesting and inspiring talk, and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion after the three presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, for this nice introductory words. Uh, I have nothing more to add. I only want to share uh, the happiness of Karin that we got it through the second edition. Uh, I think this is a, a very nice sign uh, that we have this perspective of continuing these talks. I think uh, it's very fascinating uh, to get together scientists, uh, experts uh, from three continents uh, in this interesting uh, talk. Uh, only one technical advice. Please turn your microphones off if you are not a speaker 
and only listening us. <coughs> Later, when you do your questions, uh, you can turn them on again. Uh, so we do not have background noises. Thank you very much. As Carolyn introduced a little bit, this cooperation for project uh, by Reut, uh, Dar es Salaam, uh, I want to introduce a little bit the Heidelberg Center. Uh, me, personally, I am a visiting professor sponsored by the DAAD, uh, the well-known German Academic Exchange Service. Uh, and I'm visiting professor in the University of Chile and in the Heidelberg Center. I think the University of Chile, I do not have to introduce it. It's a big traditional uh, full university uh, as you know it. But I want to uh, say uh, two sentences about the Heidelberg Center because it's a little bit special and a little bit different. The Heidelberg Center is a center founded by the University of Heidelberg and we are not annexed directly to a Chilean university. We have various cooperation partners, University of Chile, but also in other areas, Catholic University of Chile, depending on the area. What are the areas you can do something in the Heidelberg Center? We have astronomy, uh, especially a doctorate program in astrophysics. You can do geosciences. Here we have uh, our master in governance of risk and resources. And I think there are some people of this master of governance of risk and resources here, because obviously this water question is a subject of them as well. Then you can do uh, medical informatics. Uh, here we have a master program as well. You can do a doctorate program in psychotherapy and we have some German language courses. And then we have, and this is uh, very important in our context, also a LLM program, a legal master. Uh, our legal master at the Heidelberg Center here in Santiago is about uh, investment, commerce and arbitration in international context. Uh, and please, my colleague uh, Marie Gavi from the coordination of the program uh, says some sentences about our LLM program. Thank you, Gavi. Thank you very much, Professor Sven, and thank you very much for all of the organizers for this space. My name is Maria Aurela Labreu from the Heidelberg Center for Latin America here in Santiago de Chile, and we held a Master of Law in International Law, Investment Training and Arbitration here in Santiago de Chile, and a last period with Heidelberg for one month. So um, we have professors from all over the world, uh, students as well. So it's really international program. For 2021 and 2022, we have extended our due date line for applications until January 25. So we invite everybody to apply and to contact us in our new forum. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sven, uh, and the floor is yours again. Ah, oh, yes, and one important detail, mentioning the German exchange service again, uh, you have the chance uh, on three uh, sponsorships of DAD uh, with living costs and the flight to Heidelberg. So if you apply, there's a chance to be sponsored by DAD as LLM student in this program. Uh, so I think uh, with nothing more, we go to the talks because uh, time is short and uh, let's get to our uh, presentations. Was mentioned today as an example of a successful career of an ex alumnus of one of our two programs. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, the program in Dar es Salaam in cooperation with Bayreuth. Uh, Omondi Robert Ovino is a Kenyan environmental lawyer. So we have Kenya very present today. Uh, and he is a senior lecturer at Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology at the School of Law, obviously. Uh, his bachelor in law is from uh, Moore University Eldred in Kenya. Then he did this master program uh, in Dar es Salaam, which we already talked about. And then he went or stayed in Bayreuth and did a doctor of laws uh, in Bayreuth. And I think he's all, uh, also a DAAD alumnus in this function as PhD student. Ovino also is advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Uh, and he has experience in, in environmental law uh, teaching, litigation, a lot of publications, presentations, which I do not have time to mention here. Um, he was on also convened by the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in the rule of law program in Nairobi about 
Africa in the context of the agreement of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP21, concluded in Paris. Um, so uh, I was fascinated, especially by his book on the Lake Victoria. I think this was also uh, his PhD thesis, a big book. So we have really uh, the expert on international water law in the context of Victoria Lake. And uh, no surprise, he will speak about the content of this a book. So uh, it's about new challenges in a transboundary water course, retooling cooperation in the Lake Victoria. The floor is yours, uh, dear uh, Omondi Robert. Thank you, Dr. Kotsilius. Thank you, Frau Herzog, for putting this together and for making sure that people around the world can have a healthy intellectual exchange one among the other. Let me start by acknowledging a few faces that I see from all over. I can see Dr. Mapunda there, and Winnie as well from uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, I can see a number of people from Bayreuth. I can see Laura there. So it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll immediately share my screen so that I try as much as I possibly can to keep within the stipulated time. I'm sure you can see it. There we go. So that is the title of my presentation, New Challenges in a Transboundary Water Course, the Tooling Cooperation in the Lake Victoria Basin. Before I start my presentation, let me qualify the term new challenges. Some of these challenges are not in themselves actually very new. But the reason why I characterize them as new is that they have changing faces. An example of a changing face is at some point, and particularly when I did my PhD research. That was in the year 2011 to 2015. The major concern in the lake was that water levels were plummeting. Actually, in some places, ships were extracting excess water from the lake to the detriment of the other states. Uh, this has now subsequently changed. Now the concern really is flooding in the lake, and that is as a result of rising water levels. So just by way of introduction, I will very briefly discuss the geography of the Lake Victoria Basin in, in uh, using a map so that I don't go into so many words. I'll try to highlight the socio, socio and economic significance and very briefly also highlight what are some of the institutions and laws that then are in place to regulate that lake since we are lawyers. Perhaps after those issues are done with, then that is where the law will stop for, very, for reasons that I will later explain. I will then very briefly in a broad outline, uh, identify challenges and discuss them. And of course, then some of the most visible challenges in the lake are climate change. We have concern about fluctuating water levels. So at times they are too low. But now they are threatening livelihoods. Actually, in Kenya now, we are planning to appear before the East African Court of Justice as amicus curia through an institution known as Pituo Chashiria in order to give input in a matter where certain citizens of Kenya have sued Uganda for releasing excess water into the lake with the consequence that they have lost their lands. That means areas that were formerly dry land have now become flooded and people have had to move away from those lands. Then there's the question of endemic pollution there is loss of biodiversity and what then I will explain as the tragedy of the commons. Despite these challenges, solutions that have been designed to address challenges in the lake are solitary. Solitary that means they are based on unilateral national approaches. These national approaches are competing, are based on or informed by competing interests. And then we have donor-oriented initiatives. 
which then makes it a very big challenge because what happens is donor fund different projects in different with different uh, foresight with the effect that then heavy dependence on donor funding has meant that countries have not developed endogenous economic activity to address the lack. And so in terms, instead of giving it uh, the priority, it should even in terms of budgetary allocations then funding by environmental policy in the Lake Victoria Basin has been elusive. We also have questions of sovereignty. Who owns which part of the lake and uh, what sovereignty do they exercise over that part of the lake? All those solutions then undermine cooperation. And that's why then I did talk of retooling cooperation. What multilateral approaches are there that these countries could exploit and what stands in the way of that? Currently, we see a situation where countries are putting the cart before the horse. Is it possible to reorient the horse before the cart as should be? Is it possible to have institutional sanction and budgetary prioritization? So ladies and gentlemen, that is the Lake Victoria. For those of you who do not know where it is, it is the second uh, largest freshwater lake in the world and uh, the largest uh, tropical lake uh, in the world, right there. And as you can see, and I will bring you another presentation, it is shared among three countries. So this is the part of the lake. I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor, this part here. This is 49% of the lake, which is in the territory of Tanzania. And we have 6%, uh, sorry, we have 46%, which then falls within the territory of Uganda. So it simply means then, Uganda and Lake Victoria have the largest portions of the lake. And Kenya comes in with a paltry 6%. So it's more of a jigsaw puzzle, as you can see. And then that is how then the different countries share the lake. The lake, which is still this, also has a basin. When I talk of a basin, I have in mind rivers that drain into the Lake Victoria. And as you can see, for example, that's the wild beast migration that some of you might have heard of. It's so interdependent that these animals cross into Tanzania and into Kenya at different times. So it becomes very difficult to severe the, the lake or the basin into unique territorial units. And so this is just to help you understand the interconnectedness. Then should be there in the lake, which then is not there and which contributes quite significantly to degradation of that very valuable resource. In terms of institutions and laws, we have the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, which is an institution established under the all species of the East African community with a coordination role. It does not have executive functions. So that means it can't dictate what the parties do or don't do. It is dependent on budgetary allocations that come from the independent states. Which budgetary allocations at times don't even come. We have the protocol on sustainable development of the Lake Victoria Basin. We have the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization Convention. And of course, we have the East Africa ESC Protocol on Natural Resources. So these are the regulatory instruments, so to speak, in the lake. However, the finding has been that the problem is not the absence of laws, as I say in my book, rather the absence of a strong political process that can make laws meaningful. And that is where then now lawyers and political scientists need to sit down and have a talk together with some, economy, uh, some economists. So then we have climate change, which is now becoming quite visible. And this is uh, seen in terms of drought and unpredictable weather patterns. Lake, receives 80% of its water from the rain, only 15% from rivers that drain into it. It has about 23 rivers in the basin that drain into the Lake Victoria Basin. 
This therefore means that when there is no rain, then the levels are susceptible to fluctuation. But also it means when there is a lot of rain, then it only has one outlet, the ginger, which is an outlet into the uh, white Nile, which then means that levels can go very high. There is uh, the fluctuating water levels, which is also a challenge, there is pollution. There is loss of biodiversity. Some species have disappeared, for example, after introduction of the Nile Patch in 1950. All this, ladies and gentlemen, give rise to a tragedy of the commons, which means every state wants to over-exploit the lake and very few states want to put in anything or take measures to ensure a sustainable exploitation of the lake. So exploitation, ladies and gentlemen, is largely unsustainable. But, ladies and gentlemen, shows the way the population is growing around the basin and population growth has a direct impact on the lake. So you can see how it has uh, progressed. And in 2014, that is how dense it was because then the red parts show you the high population density. This here is a clip of challenges in the lake. I'm not sure whether you can hear it. So ladies and gentlemen, that is a clip of, uh, from, uh, it's, uh, from CNN, as you can see there, just for acknowledgement. It's a few years old now, but it captures the essence of the challenges that we have in the lake. This is what we are presently dealing with. Two or three weeks ago, fish had started washing off in the shore in uh, Uganda. I mean, the government encouraged people not to uh, eat the dead fish. Scientists have alleged that chances are that these fish have died as a result of low oxygen levels or what is scientifically referred to as hypoxia. This simply means that then with the pollution and with the eutro eutrophication, which means when the lake becomes fertile, and you have algal blooms, you have water hyacinth, they are low and there are low oxygen levels for the fish. And then the Nile patch is particularly sensitive to low oxygen levels. And so a lot of they die in their thousands and then they're subsequently washed ashore. That's the kind of tragedy, ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing with. And I continue saying then that the solutions we have until now in terms of competing interests, and these ones are acute in fish and water. Some of you might have had, uh, might remember the Mijingo Island dispute between Kenya and Uganda, which was really informed by fishing. But Uganda has three dams on Lake Victoria. There's the Narubale Dam, there's the Kish, too much water, at times they release too much water. So that shows you what some of the competing interests would be. These challenges have not been addressed collectively as ought to be, but they are addressed unilaterally. And that simply means then that the self-interest that informs these unilateral interventions negates collective outcomes that would engender sustainability. There are donor interventions, and uh, it means these interventions are multiple and uncoordinated. The effect that then these initiatives exacerbate the challenges in the lake rather than alleviate it. Countries don't want to cede sovereignty. You saw the wild beast migration. 
honestly, you can't say the wild beasts are mine because this is nature. And nature or geography does not respect cartography. It does not respect boundaries running across a map. And so then what the EU has done is that they have given up a measure of their sovereignty in terms of resources. And that means they could be answerable to an executive institution that has certain powers. Operation, if we were to retool it, would mean we should develop multilateral approaches and mine by concerns of sovereignty. We should have a strong political process as a prerequisite to getting stringent laws. We cannot start with laws. We must get the political process right. We should have strong institutions. And we should have clear budgetary allocations to address some of these challenges. I mean, in the book that is out there, just maybe to quote a bit of what I say, I say that inquiry is relevant in view of the litany of the environmental challenges that afflict the Lake Victoria Basin. In this context, the book makes a finding that the legal frameworks and institutions responsible for effective management and transboundary cooperation in the Lake Victoria Basin are fairly in poet, that means they're not fully developed, they're anodyne, which means they are weak in nature. From this assessment, emphasis is made that the solution in resolving the conundrum in the Lake Victoria and its basin lies not in adopting more laws to regulate diverse transboundary aspects of the Lake Victoria Basin, but rather in initiating a strong political process that should eventually enhance the quality of extant laws and heighten the reach and height of institutional implementation. This study underscores political will as an indispensable pathway to robust legal measures that ought to drive effective, effective transboundary resource cooperation in the Lake Victoria Basin. However, the fact that political will is still weak undermines the uh, cooperation in the lake where then statist concerns take center stage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. And I think I have uh, uh, four so minutes to go. I hope I didn't rush too fast, but I will be glad at the tail end of the presentations to take questions. Thank you once again. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Professor o Ovino, uh, for this fascinating speech uh, and really very uh, punctual. Uh, you did not use your 20 minutes. Uh, very, very nice this as well. So we have more time for a debate. Uh, and I also laughed, uh, if I may confess this, uh, that you talked more about uh, legal policies and not so much on detailed legal norms as such. Uh, I think this opens our talk uh, to the interdisciplinarity we want uh, as well, not only interregions, but uh, uh, also uh, between the disciplines. And I think this uh, uh, helps me to build a bridge to our next speaker, uh, to Simon Schau. Well, Simon Schau is not a lawyer, uh, but he analyzes uh, policy making uh, processes. Uh, Simon Schau, um, uh, he finished his uh, PhD thesis is waiting for the oral exam, I see. Uh, so we call him in German a PhD candidate. Um, uh, he studied political science at Heidelberg University from 2011 to 2017. His master's thesis was on the subject of regulation of risk technologies in the European Union. There it was about genetically modified organisms. Since 17, Schaub is academic assistant at Professor Jale Tosun's chair. Um, and this chair is, participates in a network of scientists, which is called EffectNet. Maybe Simon may talk a little bit uh, on this network as well, and not only on uh, his own investigation inside this network. EffectNet, a multi-scale effect network for hazard identification and risk evaluation 
of high consumption chemicals in aquatic ecosystems. So this may be drugs, pharmaceuticals and food additives, which enter in the water. Uh, these small micro balls you have in some creams, etc., which pollute the water uh, from receptors to biodiversity. This is funded by the Ministry of Science and Culture of Baden-Württemberg. Uh, maybe later Simon may show um, how to access the site of them as well. And Simon now will speak about the struggle over sustainable policy solutions, the case of water pollution by contaminants of emerging concern. Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sven, for the very good introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Uh, yes, um, and thanks as well for giving me the opportunity to present our project and also to talk about my PhD thesis, which is nearly finished. So it's another two months to go and hope I can defend it soon. Yes, um, it was really interesting to already hear um, from Roberto from his work on, on surface water and, and, and pollution and, and other issues. And I'm going to talk about a, a topic that has just recently um, received more and more attention. And it's uh, about micro pollutants or contaminants of emerging concern. And uh, this, this is a kind of a, a new type or, of pollutant that enters uh, surface waters. And there's more and more research on this topic. And actually, when I grew up in Germany, um, I always had the impression that actually water in Germany is of very good quality. It's, there's no issues with drinking water. It's really easy. Uh, you just yeah, you just uh, drink the water from the tap. You don't. There's no concerns at all. And also with with bathing, you can nearly enter every every lake or every river and, and go swimming there. And then when I started to do my PhD, then I so suddenly noticed actually there are issues. And um, if you follow um, the, the, the press or the, the media reports, uh, you could actually see that there are still issues in Europe and in Germany. And for example, these are German newspaper articles published just uh, two years ago. Um, there was a, a report by the European Environmental Agency on the condition, on the, on the water quality condition in Europe, and actually found that the, the most rivers and, and lakes in Germany are actually in a quite a bad uh, situation. And um, yeah, that's just like a, a few examples of that media report that actually caused quite some attention. For example, it says German, German uh, waters or German rivers are in a bad condition. Um, and this is a, is a graph from the report. Um, it's actually on the ecological status um, of, of a river basin or diff different river basin districts. We have different river basin districts in, in Europe that are evaluated. And um, you can see that all the areas in red, they are not in a good condition. And you can see Germany in the middle and actually you can see it's, it's mostly red. And um, the question is why this is the case, because Germany actually has been a forerunner in environmental legislation in the last, I don't know, in the last decades, 30, 40 years. And um, there, has, there has been a, like really significant improvement in water quality, um, because like 30, 40 years ago, actually the rivers were really polluted by in, industrial, uh, um, yeah, um, waters and uh, you, like you could see that fish swimming on the surface and that's not the case anymore. The water is clear. So it's quite a surprise um, in the beginning. Um, maybe some words on the legal background. Um, the European Union has a quite um, ambitious uh, legal uh, directive. It's the Water Framework Directive. And that one actually requires uh, EU member states to achieve a good status of uh, surface water and groundwater by 2027. So this legal directive is actually guided by a, a certain normative aim. 
Um, and achieving the good status involves meeting certain standards for the ecology, chemistry, and the quantity of waters. And um, there's a focus on the ecological status of surface waters, so that's why I give you a short definition. Um, the ecological con condition of surface water is determined by comparing the status quo of um, aquatic communities uh, existing in surface waters with the aquatic communities that should be there naturally. So you have an idea of what should be in the, in the surface water under natural conditions, and then you compare it to what you actually see empirically, and then you can you get an impression on, on how good the status is. And um, actually in most German uh, waters, um, there should be a much more vivid and rich biodiversity as there actually is. Um, so that's it's a puzzle that's still, it's not really clear why. Um, yeah. But the, the European Environmental Agency, they identify different uh, pressures and you can see on the left, um, there's, a, there's a big problem in Germany with hydromorphological degradation. Um, back in Germany, 100 years ago, um, a lot of rivers, they were streamed, straightened or dammed, and that caused huge problems for the, um, ec for the ecological um, uh, system or the, for, for aquatic life. Um, that's, that's one big problem. The other one is agriculture. Um, Germany is, is uh, characterized by a, a large agricultural sector. And there's problems with nutrients that enter um, rivers um, and groundwater. There's problem with fine sediments and there's a big problem with pesticides. Germany as well is, is characterized by a strong industrial agricultural sector. So a lot of um, efforts have been done to actually increase the efficiency of agriculture. And that also means um, to use a lot of pesticides. So all this is known, but the fact what you see below, these are like um, the contaminants of emerging concern and their effects are actually less known. And among these are industrial chemicals, um, for example, for, for cleaning clothes. Um, another one is microplastics and then hygiene and, and detergents. And another one is pharmaceutical residues. So always if you take medicine, your body is not able to absorb every or the, the, the whole substance. You, so always um, there's some part of the medicine is going to be, uh, go back to, to, the, um, to, um, to the water. Um, and concerning pharmaceutical residues, and there's actually more and more scientific evidence um, that there actually is negative impact on aquatic life in, in water. And if, if, if we focus on the pharmaceutical residues, because the evidence is, is best in this case, is we can see it's actually a really complex problem. What you can see in this graph, there's a lot of different entry pathways. Um, you can see on, on the right, um, because medicines are used in agriculture, so there's veterinary use, so from this, um, um, the medicines enter manure and in the end, they somehow end up in groundwater and surface waters. The other one is human use. So medicines are used and then they go into sewage water, then they enter treatment plants. And the problem at the moment is that most treatment plants are not able to filter these substances. They just go unfiltered into the treated wastewater and then go back to surface waters. And adding to this is that actually with, with uh, pharmaceutical residues is um, that there are different policy goals that need to be addressed. Um, if, if you want to solve this problem, you need to address the problem in somehow in an integrated way and somehow needs a kind of nexus thinking. So different aspects or different policy goals are somehow connected like in a system. That's also why we talk about the water health food nexus. And there's one aim is the water quality protection or environmental protection. The other thing is health security because we need medicines that work and we need the population to be able to take these medicines. 
that's what we see at the moment with, with, the, with the COVID pandemic. It's really important to have these medicines and they need to be functional. And um, the other thing is food security. We need to have an agricultural system that is able to uh, produce food in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, quantities and, and, and uh, quantities that are actually achievable for the population. So efforts to achieve one goal might actually hamper achieving connected policy goals. If you don't take this whole problem like in an overarching way. So what's the research interest, especially like uh, from my side or, or um, from, from Jale Tozun and, and for me, that is that we saw that actually, yeah, there's growing scientific evidence for negative impacts of various kinds of contaminants in emerging concern. And actually in, in the European Union, we have the precautionary principle that allows policymakers to take regulatory action already when there's already only pre preliminary scientific evidence. So actually, you don't have to prove that something is harmful in order to take um, action. You can already, if there's just a sign or just preliminary evidence, you can already take um, regulatory action. So the ground is there. It's possible to, to, to take action. And then what we see, at least in Germany, is um, the response is really weak. There's not much, not much has been done in, in this way, at least um, regarding like, um, strict regulation. And um, the other question is, what actually is the best way to address the issue of pollution by contaminants of emerging concern that's related to the, the nexus thinking and uh, interrelated policy goals? And the other thing is, what type of policy solutions are available? So there are different policy approaches um, that are discussed in the, in the, in the literature or are among experts. And uh, you can actually um, differentiate differentiate between two different approaches. One is to tackle the source of the problem, that, um, that uh, these approaches aim at preventing contamination from the onset. Um, you can, or these approaches either may tackle industry, like the production of chemicals, it's possible to um, improve the production to um, actually make these pharmaceuticals less or more environmentally friendly from the beginning. The other thing is uh, agriculture. You can tackle the agricultural sector and, um, and have strict uh, regulations on medicine use or pesticides use. The other uh, thing is uh, consumers of uh, medication, like ordinary citizens, um, to uh, give them advice in, in the usage and disposal of medicines. And the other, the, the second approach is the so-called end of pipe approach. And that one is only directed at removing contaminants from water, from, from wastewater. So the idea is um, to improve the, the wastewater treatment, to invest resources in, um, in, in new technologies and um, to, up, to, to make them able to actually filter the, the contaminants of emerging concern. The problem here is just these upgrades are really cost intensive. Uh, you, you have to see there's a lot of wastewater treatment plants and upgrading all of these is just a lot of money. And then we have these, we have these different policy approaches and then there are also different policy instruments one could apply. And the first one is voluntary uh, instruments. That's always the one that policymakers refer to first because they can show that they do something. And um, that the idea is to change behavior without coercion. And uh, if, if you think about consumers, that's one way is to increase problem awareness through uh, campaigns. And the other idea is to actually reach voluntary agreements with industry or agriculture. Um, so policymakers, they, they meet with um, actors from, from industry and then they sit together and say, okay, um, it would be good if you take these measures. If you don't, we are going to have strict regulation. Um, so the other one is command and control regulation. So that's really strict regulation. Um, this type of regulation directly regulates or imposes desired behavior, for example, through strict authorization procedures or through bans on certain substances. And the third category is uh, market-based instruments. These provide incentives for behavioral change um, one can distinguish between positive incentives, for example, uh, 
is mainly subsidies. For example, we can subsidize the development of more environmentally friendly products. And the other way is so-called on negative incentives. Um, you can just put a tax on less environmentally friendly behavior. For, for example, people need to pay more for a less environmentally friendly product. So if we turn to the political realm, then we can, if you look at these different policy approaches and instruments, then they differ in the target groups they address and in the level of pressure they impose on these target groups. And from this, we can expect that different political interests that exist in this policy field, that they somehow try to prevent or push for different policy responses. And what we also know is that they use different strategies to achieve their aims. So what we do is we take a governance perspective. So I'm not sure how familiar with, you are with these terms, so I'm going to introduce them a little bit. Um, the governance perspective is a rather new perspective. It looks not only at traditional governmental actors like polit political parties or parliamentarians, but considers a broad range of, po of political actors that try to influence policymaking. So these could, can also be like NGOs, environmental groups, or industry associations. And then as well, we have different arenas of influence, so different arenas where these actors try to influence the policymaking. The, the, the first one is the, the rather traditional one is uh, classical lobbying. So political actors, they try to create contacts with decision makers and then they try to reach so-called backroom deals. Um, it's, it's a phenomenon, very typical, hard to study because they don't want to make this public. The second arena is, is becoming more and more popular is, our, is, a, is a stakeholder consultation. So mostly uh, ministries, they invite um, these different stakeholders like actors that somehow have an interest in the policy field. Then they sit together and they talk about problems and, and solutions. And in Germany, there has been a stakeholder consultation at the federal level, the so-called stakeholder dialog Spurenstoffstrategie des Bundes from 2016 until 2019. The third one is the public debate. So that's another arena where we actually put a lot of attention. And uh, the public debate is mainly from media. And the idea is that actors try to be very really present in the media to um, influence the agenda setting and to raise awareness for their positions and solutions. And then there's a fourth one, it's a, um, it's a juridical, um, that actually in Germany, um, associations or organizations, they are able to, um, to, to take class actions against, for example, the, the government. And in addition, um, there's different levels in, in Germany. We have the federal level, and then we have the European level. So, these arenas can be at the European level as well. A lot of lobbyists sit in Brussels. And then we have the state level where actually different, um, different measures are implemented. Okay, um, so we did uh, lots of different things and I want to give you an, an insights in uh, two studies uh, we conducted. The first one is we wanted to know what's actually the consumer awareness, how aware are citizens in Germany of the problem and what's, what's their, what are their preferences towards uh, potential solutions. And therefore we um, took a, a representative survey with 2000, about 2000 respondents in 2017. And we asked them a set of questions on problem awareness, environmental attitudes, their perceived causation and uh, preferred policy solutions. And what we could see is that um, there's actually different, uh, the, or the, their, their problem causation varies. There's about 30% of people that actually mostly blame the industry for the problem. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then you can see that um, some also see the agriculture as responsible. And uh, what was interesting is that actually most of them, they would agree that actually everyone has some responsibility. And, but there's only a, a, a only a few that actually blame themselves, like the, the private households. So that would actually lead us to think, okay, 
um, their, their motivation to, um, to take action by themselves is actually not that big. Then what we could see as well is if we, if we look at um, possible um, policy instruments, that actually most uh, citizens, they would actually prefer traditional command and control regulation. That was kind of a surprise for us. But on the other hand, if you think about it, people always, they don't really want to pay more money. So that's why they object taxes and, and fees. And um, yeah. And then as the, the second study, I um, hope I can make it in the, in the remaining minutes. And that we did a media analysis. And what we did is we looked at the time frame between 2013 until 2017 and investigated um, the media reporting in uh, a thousand newspaper articles. And what we wanted to do is to, to actually investigate what type of actors appear in the public debate. Um, like who is investing resources to actually try to influence the public opinion or the media reporting. And then we wanted to investigate what actually are the lines of conflict what is the dominant policy narrative? And are we able to identify actor coalitions based on the shared policy preferences? And um, here in this graph, you can see the type of actors that participated in the, in the debate, mostly actually water associations. So they were really upset because they had to bear the costs of, an, of improved water treatment. Then we can see a lot of attention by scientific actors then not very surprising, the Green Party. And then we can see there's a lot of actually um, actors from government. And uh, much more to our surprise, not many uh, consumer protection organizations or environmental organizations. So this also led us to see that um, the agenda setting in this regard is more like top down, we call it top down, it's more like from the state side or from, from science and not from bottom up. Like we don't have like strong environmental organizations that push for this topic. And these are their positions on different, different um, we call this concepts. Um, we could see that actually they, they mostly agree on things. Uh, they agree that there's a risk for the environment. Um, most of them actually disagree there's a risk for human health. Uh, most of them blame the consumers to be responsible for this problem. Not many the industry. And the other thing is they also blame the wastewater treatment sector. And that's where they, they, they see the solutions, um, mostly to inform consumers and to upgrade um, wastewater treatment. And what we could see as well is they did not really pay much attention on specific policy instruments. And uh, like the maybe final slide is that what we use is a, a method called discourse network analysis. And, uh, that's a method we, we, you normally use also to um, identify different co actor coalitions. And if we would see different actor coalitions like a politicized debate, then we would see two different clusters, two different groups of actors. And what we see, see here is the exact opposite. It's just one big clunch of, of actors that are really similar in their positions. Yeah, maybe to conclude, so the contamination of surface water by contaminants of emerging concern is a complex problem that needs integrated policy solutions to achieve competing policy goals. And the puzzle is despite growing scientific evidence for negative impacts, um, the policy response in Germany has been weak. And the weak response can be explained by a stronger interest to achieve health security, a strong influence by industrial actors, and a lack of a lack of concerted public efforts to push for a significant policy change. Yeah. Um, final information on, on the project. Uh, Sven, you already introduced it a lot. There's a link to the website. It has a website. Uh, maybe if we, if we share the slides, maybe later on um, you can you can have a look. And there's some more information on recent publications. Um, yeah. Then thank you for your attention. Ah, thank you very much, Simon, for this uh, very uh, open um, presentation. I think it has a lot of points uh, in common with uh, what we heard before. Uh, I think we, uh, in the debate, uh, there are a lot of questions we can debate uh, in a comparative uh, way, uh, because both speakers spoke a little bit more on this policy making, this process, yeah, that 
uh, a law uh, is not simply made uh, very quickly, but that there are long years of public debate before uh, of a lawmaking. I think this is very interesting. And then the second phase, the law implementation. I think here we can go a little bit more profoundly uh, also in the debate, uh, because this is what uh, Robert uh, Omondi, Robert, uh, criticized a lot uh, that the laws are good, but the, implement the implementation uh, has some problems. Uh, me personally, I saw a lot of points of interest for me. Uh, for, for example, the precautionary principle uh, is important for our students as well, because we study the law of the um, World Trade Organization. And in the World Trade Organization, it's really debated if they adopt the precautionary principle or not. There was a lot of critique against the World Trade Organization uh, that they would be a very a low level protection of environment in their policies. Um, now let's uh, see uh, the third uh, presentation uh, of my uh, colleague Pilar Moraga. And I think obviously we have a lot in common as well here uh, because obviously in the last years, the public debate in Chile is very, very active and allowed. Uh, water was also a subject of the public protests, uh, which uh, uh, came up uh, end of uh, 2019. Obviously not a surprise because this water policy problem is a long problem in Chile. Let me introduce briefly Pila Moraga to you. So she works at the law school of University of Chile. She is actually the deputy director of the Environmental Law Center, is the principal investigator of the Center for Climate and Resilience Research, and she teaches and writes on water law, environmental law, and climate change, and published in the same areas. And I think she is not a German alumni uh, or alumna, uh, but a European alumna as well. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, she did her PhD in France. Uh, so uh, also uh, internationally open personality. And uh, Pilar Moraga will speak about the intertwined social and environmental conflict about uh, water in Chile. I think the social dimension uh, also became uh, visible in the two talks before. Uh, thank you, uh, Pilar, for accepting my invitation. The floor is yours now. Thank you, Sven. I am very happy to be here. Thank you for invitation and to for organization to hello everybody. Thank you to to be here too. Uh, today I'd like to speak about social and environmental conflict in Chile, and in particular about the dispute between mining and glaciers protection. To start, I have mentioned that water demand and climate variability increases competition and tension between, between water users, agricultural, industrial, mining, hydropower, and local communities. Just a second, because... Excuse me. I try to. Okay. So, since 1981, the Water Code was regulated water allocation throughout private and individual property rights. Foresting market adds as the distribution mechanism among users. The legislation didn't consider environmental aspects before 2005. In that moment, the legislator introduced some little reforms concerning, for example, the minimum ecologic, ecological flu. Actually, regulation on water, water management, and the water market are essentially separate. 
from the regulation of environmental law. And under the current institutional framework, the Directorate General of Waters does not have the power to ensure environmental protection. In addition, we can mention that the Water Authority is responsible of glaciers management, but there isn't an special legislation in this area. This context explains the, the situation uh, why the water dispute in Chile that are brought before the court of justice are mainly related to owner, ownership and property uses. And only a small percentage to environmental issues. You can see uh, this situation in this slide because the environmental conflict is a little part of this graphic. Despite this, it could be argued that environmental disputes over water and many cases appear to be the reflection of deeper problems relating to the conflict over water management between users of different uses of this resource, particularly in connection with mining activity. The increased activity on environmental courts as a means of resolving water environmental conflict became evident later on from approximately 2017 onwards. Ah, excuse me. For example, the exponential increase in conflict in Antofagasta region in the north of Chile from 2017 onwards is no streaking. The main actors are Atacameño, Atacameño indigenous organizations and the owners of mine projects in the Salar de Atacama. And the water component is associated with all of these as a relevant subject for the discussion. So concerning, concerning the parties in the environmental water conflict in Chile, we can affirm the plaintiff in environmental disputes over water use and rights are for the most part neighborhood and community boards farmers, indigenous people, and water users organization. As for the defendants, in all cases, this comprise the environmental authorities. Actually, considering thus, that these are the state administration agencies that manage the environmental permits of projects, the most controversial issues in environmental conflict over water is their approval of investment project on environmental assessment process, since the disputes arise with respect to this type of activities. Now, concerning the content of environmental water conflict. In this uh, matter, uh, we can say the content or cause, causes of this conflict, we can affirm that the districts arise because those activities are a potential threat to water resource in terms of risk, quality, or scarcity. The environmental plaintiff concerning water are brought to environmental tribunals through the environmental responsibility demand. The environmental court was created in Chile in 2012. This 
is a new specialized justice in that of hearing claims that seek this reparation and remediation of damaged environment. These are brought with the environmental damage reparation remedy provide for Article 53 of law and general environmental basis. So it's not the water law. In this regard, the, it should first be noted that the legislature understand reparation as the act of restoring the environment or one or more of these components to a condition similar to one that exists before the damage was inflicted. Or if this not possible, restoring its basic properties. So environmental damage is any significant loss, reduction, detriment, or impairment inflicted to the on the environment or one or more of its components. This is the important definition. In this respect, one judgment of the environmental court is related to glaciers protection. In these claims, for the for environmental damage caused by the Pasca, Pascualama mining project to the glacier, excuse me, to the glacier in the north of the country before the second environmental court of Santiago. This is a lawsuit for environmental damage on behalf of civil society against the Pascualama project as a result of damage caused to the glacier located near to the project activities, and in particular to the existing concerns regarding protection of the glacier in this, in this region in Chile. It's the north of Chile in the area very, very uh, affected by, uh, by deficit, water deficit. This is an um, uh, important uh, case in Chile, and the claim was lodged by small scale agriculture and livestock farmers and by NGO, the Observatorio Latinoamericano de Conflictos Ambientales, arguing that the project would cause an alleged significant impact or impairment only with respect to the Toro 1, Toro 2, and Esperanza glaciers. We can slide the situation of this glacier in this slide. However, the court held that there is a multiplicity of evidentiary background and pieces of evidence that are consist with one other assessed in accordance with the rules of sound judgment that allow for confirming that the historical trend of the loss of the ice body must in the project's area of influence has not be altered. Based on this, it is clear that the second environmental court of Santiago could not establish the causal link between the mining activity and the impact on the glacier. Notwithstanding that is acknowledged a loss of surface attributable able to climate condition, whether due to variability or of an anthropogenic origin, is as indicated by the defender. Based on that opinion, the reduction of the surface area of the previously mentioned glaciers could not be considered as a result of human activity, mining activity, rather as a consequence of global warming. In light of that argument, and in view of the opinion that there was not significant damage 
attributable to the mining activity in question, the second environmental courts of Santiago decide to reject the claim for environmental damage filed by so civil society against the Pascua Lama mining project for eventual environmental damage caused by the pro that project, which had been environmentally approved by way of the environmental classification, excuse me, the environmental qualification resolution in 2006. To finish, we can conclude this is a, a, there is various standards offer a variety of level of protection to our glacier ecosystems, but they are they are tangential, precarious, and insufficient in their effectiveness to obtain adequate protection. In addition, on many occasions, that action granted to citizens are cumbersome and difficult to apply the common people in an effective and timely manner. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much, Pila, and very, very punctual as well. Uh, I think you didn't take your 20 minutes. Um, and I think uh, this contribution was very, very uh, valuable uh, to complete the picture which uh, the two other speakers painted already. Uh, I think uh, you talked uh, very well about changes in legislation. Uh, I, as a foreign visitor in Chile, am very fascinated uh, by the creation of environmental courts. This is something which in Germany, for example, does not exist, such a specialized court. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy that you presented us a case. I think it a uh, case study uh, always is very, um, how do you say, very concrete, uh, and we can imagine the structure of the con uh, conflict very, very well. Uh, but me, uh, I don't want to talk first. I want to open the floor to our public. Uh, now, uh, please, uh, uh, your questions. And uh, obviously, because they are so intertwined, maybe the three colleagues have uh, questions to each other as well, uh, from their perspective to one of the other speakers. Uh, this could be a very interesting talk as well if we bring the three speakers together, uh, but nothing uh, forced. Uh, questions first, maybe, and I think there are some virtual hands you may raise. Uh, I think we uh, simply can uh, orally uh, post our questions to the speakers. Who has a question? Who breaks the ice, <laughs> as always in these conferences? <laughs> if you are oh, there is uh, Simon wants to start. Thank you, Simon. I can start. Yes. Um, I have a question to Pilar. Like from the view of the environment, environment protection, where do you see the problem? Is this the problem with that the regulation is not strict enough or not clearly defined enough? Or is it more problem with the courts that are maybe are not independent or they are influenced by certain interests? Uh, in, this, yeah. in this case, the problem is, uh, is the legislation because we don't have the legislation to protect the glaciers. This is the first problem. The second problem is the is a governance problem because the administration, the manage of glacier is uh, a responsibility of water institution or water authority. And the water authority uh, doesn't uh, have the responsibility to protect the ecosystems. So we have two 
system complete, completely, completely separate water and environmental legislation and protection. So this is the first uh, big problem because the water legislation, the water governance don't see, don't, um, don't work to protect ecosystems. It's the environmental ministry and not the water authority. Mm. So uh, there is not a coordinate. Um, so is, yes. Yep. No. yep, thank you, that answered my question. Ah, yeah. the, second, the second problem is the, maybe the information because in this case, the glacier is, the, is in the mountains and uh, is very difficult to access. Mm. So the information, the monitoring, uh, is uh, done by by the project, by by the private, mm. not by the state or the authority. So how we know the evolution of this glacier? Uh, we know uh, thanks to information provided by the private sector. So this is the second problem. We don't have a um, uh, register or good record of the, um, the glaciers in the territory, for example. Yeah. More questions? Do I see more hands? Yeah, uh, Omondi, Robert, please. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> My question would also go to Pila. I was a bit fascinated when she talked about the environmental court, uh, which is what an institution we also have in Kenya from 2011. I think she said that the court has been uh, in existence since 2012. So I would uh, be interested in knowing, not uh, specifically with respect to the glaciers, but in the eight years the court has been operational. Would you say there's a direction in terms of its decisions if there's a direction, are those uh, decisions liberal or are they conservative? Are they pro-environment or the court has not until now exhibited clear jurisprudence? Thank you. Thank you. In the case of Chile, the environmental court have different co uh, competences. So only one is concerning the um, environmental damage. The other competences uh, is in relation with um, public decisions in environment. I, I don't know if I am clear, but it's important because in general, the decision of the environmental courts are the administrative decision in relation with the permits, authorization, and others, or sanctions. But only one competence concern um, the environmental protection directly is the environmental damage responsibility. So the competence is very uh, small. And in this, in this, um, in this, competence or damage, uh, or environmental damage, I think the, the courts are very open to protect the environment. And in general, uh, they try to, to create or interpret, interpret the, the legislation in the uh, good term to environment. So it's not, they are not a conservative uh, opinion in general. I don't know if I yeah. respond. Thank you. Thank you, then maybe just one last question so that I don't take all the time for everybody. Is there a right to environment in Chile? In your right environment? Yes, 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 <coughs> yes. We, we, we have a right, um, a right uh, is a 
yes, we have an, an environmental right and that progress in the first, uh, in the last uh, 30 years in the jurisprudence. I, I think the content is more open than before uh, because uh, the, um, the definition in the constitution is linked with the pollution, but the courts understand this right concern the ecosystems or the health, but not only pollution. So I think in the, in the last uh, years we progressed in this sense, but I hope the new constitution, uh, because we are in, in the process to a new constitution, we uh, will have um, ecological constitution. So more strong to the environmental protection. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, I wanted, please, um, that Professor uh, Ovino responds his own question for the countries he is investigating uh, so that we get into uh, a comparative uh, discourse. Now we know that Chile has a growing uh, recognition of uh, a right on a uh, clean environment. And I understand Pilar that she sees it as a subjective right. I think this is, we have to differentiate very, very clear. Uh, later, Simon and me uh, may talk a little bit about German, uh, Germany, about the difference between an objective right and a subjective right. Because the importance when we get to the courts, at least from my German perspective, is the recognition as a subjective right. And here we have uh, grave deficits in Germany, as Simon maybe will confirm. So I am interested, maybe you take one, two, or all the three countries, if you know, which uh, make part of your uh, image and talk us about the situation uh, of environment uh, as a subjective right in your countries you are expert in. So that we complete the picture with all of the three uh, areas we are uh, bringing together in this talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kozilius, for this question. In uh, Kenya, we have the right to a clean and healthy environment in the constitution under Article 42. And uh, that is uh, principally a right that is uh, principally adjudicated by the Environment and Land Court, which I have said was established in 2011. I am aware that uh, a similar right is uh, present under the Ugandan constitution However, the Tanzanian constitution has until now not uh, dealt with the right to a clean and healthy environment. Having said that, in respect of Tanzania, there are court decisions that then try to interpret the right to life in order to extend uh, that right to a clean, healthy environment. I would uh, maybe talk in terms of uh, how the right to a clean and healthy environment is reflected in the Kenyan constitution and look at it in terms of substantive rights and procedural rights. Substantive rights means that that provision is secured under Article 42 of the Kenyan constitution. However, there are other enabling rights, such as Article 35 of the Kenyan constitution, right to information, for example, there is Article 48, access to justice, there is Article 47 from fair administrative action, and such rights would therefore then become procedural rights or vehicles, the realization of the right to a clean and healthy environment as are contemplated under Article 42 of the Constitution. I would not be very deep in terms of the Ugandan practice, but I do know for sure that the 1995 Constitution was one of the early constitutions to embrace to recognize environment as a critical right. The Kenyan constitution goes ahead also in its preamble to set an aspiration, the realization of sustainable development, which uh, really speaking is a good attempt. 
when I come to the jurisprudence of the courts, in our uh, jurisdiction, I can say the jurisprudence is a bit everywhere. <laughs> that simply means that you do not see a clear pattern emerging from the courts. And I possibly explain that uh, with the reason that the courts are still arguably young, arguably means they're nine years old, and most judges who sit in those courts were common law judges who then interpreted common law remedies as uh, alternatives to protect environmental rights. So a common law remedy would be, for example, using nuisance as an argument to protect environmental rights. But since we have come of age, I have made the experience that when I look at judges who, for example, have masters in environmental law, then their jurisprudence takes a very environmental friendly approach, which then would uh, in Latin be in dubio pro natura, which means when in doubt, mm -hmm. make a decision in favor of the environment. But I think it is still too young to tell. A given time, then we should see what emerges from the courts and then see whether we can draw a clear line in terms of jurisprudential output of that court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon, maybe you want to complete this picture uh, for Germany with this European perspective. Yes, I, I can try. Um, maybe you have to, to add or maybe to correct me. Well, from, because I'm like I'm not a really an expert in, 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 in law, but as far as I understand the, the objective law in, in, in the European Union and in Germany as well is um, I would say quite advanced regarding the environment. Um, so the problem I was talking about was more like on subjective law, like the implementation of, 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 of specific regulation. And um, that's that's more, I mean, the, the, the issue of, of contaminants of emerging concern is, is a new problem. And so there's there's more like a, a lack in, uh, in uh, on the one hand, in setting these like new, subjective laws, and then also on, on, on specific implementation. Yeah. Ah, no, I, I was thinking more about a, a subjective right. As lawyers, mm -hmm. we, we differentiate between objective, which, which would be, it obliges maybe the state, but you as a citizen are not able to make a claim because of it. Uh -huh. But if it is a subjective right, then you make, uh, are able to make a claim. And in this sense, the German constitution does not have it as, for example, a fundamental right or a human right. So you could not go to constitutional court to say, my environmental right is violated. Yeah, there's a deficit in this, uh, in, in this aspect. We have only what we call in German, uh, aim of a state, Staatszielbestimmung, no? uh, that the clean environment is an objective aim, which the state has to, uh, secure, but it's not the quality of the of a subjective right, and this makes it difficult. Maybe we can open a second round uh, about this uh, when we come to concrete procedure procedure law. This makes it difficult in Germany that we have few possibilities to enter with individual actions against polluters, for example. This uh, makes it necessary. What Simon very well mentioned, the class actions. What do we understand class action? Maybe there are different concepts of class actions, which is very important. Simon mentioned it, I, I only repeat it. Uh, the uh, European communities and now European Union in this directive, they force the member states that they allow environmental as associations to do claims against environmental pollution. So we are in Germany, we are not forerunners in this area. We were forced by a, a European Union directive to allow these associations to do this. We are very, very reluctant in Germany, unfortunately, to um, recognize these as subjective rights. And um, in, in, in the reality, there are not a lot of successful actions of nature protecting associations. Uh, so this would uh, interest me in the two other uh, contexts we uh, are meeting today, uh, Chile and this 
Victoria Lake group of the three states. Uh, how is it um, with this uh, possibility to enter with a, with a true action? Yeah, in Germany, you have really to say, I am affected. This poison in the water uh, affected my personal health or my fish died because of your poison. You cannot say some fish in a lake very far from my home died because of your pollution. Yeah, this subjectivation or this kind of making it subjective to protect objective interests. This is very low developed in Germany. And I would wonder if it in your regions is better developed. Excuse me, Professor. May can I ask a question, please? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, my name is Luis Yitingwa, and uh, I would like to ask two questions. My first question goes to Dr. Mondi. I would like to know, Dr. Earlier on your, on your presentation, you referred to uh, ongoing cases at the East African Court of Justice regarding uh, against Uganda. And you say it was uh, the cases about the use of water of Lake Victoria. But I would like to have your, 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 your take and your perspective analysis on the principle of uh, equitable and reasonable use of water among all riparian nations, especially on that, ex uh, on that uh, specific context. And my second question goes to uh, Pilar. Does your country, Chile, recognize the right of, to conservation of indigenous people? Or is it your country is a signatory member of the Declaration of the United Nations on the right of uh, indigenous people? So if you can uh, uh, help me to understand that context. But also I would like to, to express my sympathy and my condolence to the Udism community for the passing away of Professor Kanyoni. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kozilius, may I proceed and respond? Yes, yes, your first one was for you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Gitino, for that question. And I mean, the question uh, tells me that you have some insight on the competing uh, principles of no harm and uh, equitable and uh, reasonable use of a water course. When we talk of the no harm principle, that simply means that any interference by an upper riparian with water along a water course is deemed as an act of harm and could even be construed as an act of war. That is the old paradigm for looking at water. And in its classical sense, then I think we could say that in the Nile River, for example, the greatest challenge that has been there between Ethiopia and Egypt, for example, even Sudan would be that when they have a dam, that dam would affect the flow of water. However, coming to equitable and reasonable use means that different riparians then are entitled to an equitable and reasonable use of the waters. Let me contextualize equitable and reasonable use within the Lake Victoria Basin. In the Lake Victoria Basin, there is a 1954 rule that is called the Agreed Curve Rule. The Agreed Curve Rule came into being when the Owen Dam, how Nalubale Dam was built, the fact that there was an agreement that that dam would not affect the natural flow of water into Egypt, that natural curve would mimic the natural flow of water as it were before the Owen Dam was built. Having said that then, the allegation against Uganda has been that whereas then the agreed curve rule would speak of equitable and reasonable utilization of water, they have been breaching that rule. That means they have been abstracting more water in breach of the agreed curve rule. Or rather, they have been releasing more water depending on the levels of the lake in breach of the agreed curve rule. There has been then desire to redefine this agreed curve rule. And there is now a Lake Victoria water abstraction policy. But then taking into consideration the lack of enforcement, 
among the nations, given that the Lake Victoria Basin Commission is just an coordinating entity, it becomes difficult to enforce any agreement that the parties adopt, even if they were to, uh, let's say, breach it, you would not take anybody to the ESCJ. That brings me to the case, uh, the ESCJ. On 22nd of March, 2020, there was flooding in Kenya due to the release of excess water or allegedly due to the release of excess water. And because of that release of excess water, certain individuals who live on the shores of Lake Victoria had to move away because then their land was flooded and was now not useful for habitation. Subsequently, these individuals did file an action before the East African Court of Justice suing Uganda for releasing water which then led to loss of land on their part. We seek to join that uh, action as Amika's Curie. And Amika's Curie is a friend of the court. And when you are a friend of the court, one of the things you should demonstrate is neutrality. And so if we are a neutral party, then it means we will guide the court on the law in terms of how do you interpret the agreed curve rule and uh, other principles that relate to an international water cost such as equitable and reasonable utilization. That means then that we will try to be as balanced as possible and let the court, with the benefit of that information then, arrive at a decision in respect of the parties before it. But as it were, we are not appearing in favor either of the Kenyans or in favor of the Uganda. I hope that answers your question, but I would welcome a follow-up if at all there is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unlike Bolivia, Ecuador, or Colombia, uh, Chile doesn't recognize in constitution a plurinational state because it's the, I think it's the first step to, to recon, recognize uh, the rights of indigenous people. So uh, the answer is in Chile, we don't recognize rights of indigenous people. Nevertheless, we have some uh, special, special legislation to indigenous people. For example, in water, uh, there is a possibility to recognize the um, indigenous water in the special condition than other citizen in, in Chile but uh, we don't have yet a special right to indigenous people, maybe to the next constitution. Uh, yes, I, as a, as a visitor, I, I have this impression uh, that these uh, problems are, are uh, heavily intertwined. For example, the conflict between large semi-industrial agricultural firms and small indigenous um, traditional producers. And this is uh, obviously about water uh, resources. Uh, more questions, more questions, more hands. More hands. If, if, if this is not the case, uh, ah, Simon again, yeah, Simon. I just wanted to come back to your uh, initial discussion on the difference between subjective and objective, right? Yeah, yeah, is yeah. Fine of you? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the correction. Uh, I noticed I learned a lot, which is, which is really, really good. Um, I just noticed that maybe a different case might be, might be really interesting in this context is the case of nitrate pollution. I'm not sure how aware you are of this topic. Is that in, in, in the European Union, there's a directive specially on nitrate and nitrate mm -hmm. is, a, um, is actually a, a nutrient that enters water, mostly for agriculture and that causes a lot of problems, um, especially for biodiversity in, in, in rivers, but can actually also be um, of, uh, of concern for human health if it enters drinking water can cause cancer, especially for, for babies. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why there's actually a strict regulation in the European Union, the nitrate directive. And that one actually forces member states to um, achieve a certain threshold. Like they have to monitor all their, their waters and actually make sure that the threshold is not exceeded. And the thing is in Germany, Germany actually has breached the directive um, actually from the beginning, never with any consequences. And that's because the industrial uh, sector, like the agricultural sector is, is really strong and there's really strong interests by farmers. But now actually um, the European Commission took Germany to the European Court of Justice. Oh. Like, and actually um, that's like the one thing, there's like the European Court of Justice where there's a lawsuit. And the other one is that actually the um, one of the German environmental organizations, the uh, Deutsche Umwelthilfe, kind of joined the European Commission and filed a lawsuit as well. That's like the, the class action. So now actually the, the German government is under a lot of pressure because now they have to act, because especially because of the lawsuit at the European Court of Justice, because if there's gonna be a second filing, that's like, it will involve a lot of like a, a big fines. They're talking about 800,000 euros a day. And um, okay. but that's what you can see is that actually that's that's like one of the um, advantages of having a multinational um, institution like the European Union, because like it would not be in the interest of the of the of Germany or at least the, the, the very strong uh, German agricultural uh, sector to change anything in the regulation on nitrate. But um, so there would probably there would not be much a change. But now because of the European Union and the strong pressure by the European Commission and the possibilities to, to, to file these lawsuits, there, there's very likely that there's gonna be a change in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, the two other speakers, you have some associations with what, what Siemens says. You want to add something from your perspective, from your national or regional perspective? Yeah, precisely. When you elaborated on the objective and subjective rights now, I understood what you're asking about. In our context, we call them uh, civil political rights and uh, social, economic, and cultural rights. Mm -hmm. So then environmental rights and such rights, right to health, right to water, those are social, cultural, and economic rights. And of course, then the enforceability you see those rights under Article 43 of the Kenyan Constitution. The enforceability is limited because they are to be realized progressively and they are also to be realized to the extent of the, uh, uh, we can say, ability available to the government. And so then it becomes difficult. Yes, you can go to court, but you cannot say that the government has not provided enough water. That, you can't go to court, that is for sure, but whether then the courts will compel the government to provide enough water will be questionable. That is a socio cultural economic right. And another good question that you asked is, does somebody need to suffer harm in order to go to court? Mm -hmm. Our constitution demonstrates that uh, you have personally suffered harm, where the right to a clean and healthy environment has been breached. So you don't need to show that oh, you, you have been that. sick or anything. You just can't go because such actions are deemed to be actions in the public interest. Mm -hmm. Now the constitution is so liberal in terms of who can go that anybody can go. And you can contrast that with other cases. Let's say personal injury claims. You cannot go to court on a personal injury claim where you cannot show a direct loss suffered by reason of the act complained of. I think that would be my addition. And of course, I would still welcome any further questions if there are. Pila, maybe the, the same thing more or less for, for Chile? In Chile, we don't have the um, right to water. Uh, and <coughs> Uh, Sven, maybe you, you understand? Yes, that's okay. Yes, okay. Thank you. So we don't have the right, a right of uh, to water, 
Uh, and the main problem in, in the constitutional context and rights is the, um, the relation between the environmental right and economic right, because there is a tension between different use, uses in, in relation to water. And because the water in, she, in Chile is a private, private right, an economic right, uh, the, um, that uh, there is the property to the right to water. So in, in the constitution, the right of property is more important than other rights in the judgment. The priority is the economic rights, property, liberty, and it's very difficult to, to establish a equal relation between this right. And this, I, I think this was the problem in the social crisis in last October, because this tension uh, provoke the difference in between the communities, uh, the vulnerable communities uh, in particular. So this is, in my opinion, this is the main problem in the present uh, constitution. So uh, this is the challenge to the next step, to the next debate, how we can establish a better relation between the rights, property, liberty, development, and uh, social rights or environmental rights. And in, in, this, in this context, we, we start the discussion about the um, uh, right of nature, right uh, to water, right to indigenous people. Uh, the, the debate is open now. The, the decision is in the society now because yes, in the um, uh, uh, constituent assembly, assembly, yes. for all the responses. Uh, are you getting tired or? In that one, in screen one and two. Who wants more questions? So interesting and important uh, matter for everybody. Question. Yeah, Luis, go ahead, yes. thank you. I would like to ask uh, Simon, uh, earlier on, you talk about uh, you talk about uh, uh, the uh, the European Commission and uh, and all the regulation about about uh, about uh, climate change and and uh, the right to environment. I would like to know whether the European Commission or uh, European Union member state had they in this in this especially in this context of climate change. Are they re, uh, recognize uh, climate refugees or environment refugees? Very you want me to answer? I have to say that I have to pass. I'm not an expert in in uh, in refugees and not climate change, so I'm actually not sure. I mean, there is the there is the, um, I'm not sure if it's a right or there's a, an obligation to actually take refugees. I'm not sure if that's a European right or if that's still like national. But you are able to take asylum for political reasons, but I'm not sure whether you can actually point to climate change as a reason for seeking asylum. 
or maybe Sven, do you know more? Yes. Um, Recently, uh, mm -hmm. the French court decided to accept a climate refugee uh, from Bangladesh. And the reason was the um, air pollution and the difficulty to help system to assist this person. So I think it's in, in, an important uh, decision in, in terms to the development to, to the refugee, climate refugees uh, status. Thank you very much for this intervention. Uh, Ma so I'm right that you have a connection to France, isn't it? Did I? Did I just Interesting. Add, add my voice? Uh, yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in international law, as it were, we have the 1951 Refugee Convention. And under the 1951 Refugee Convention and under the 1967 OAU Convention, climate change is not one of the criteria for uh, extending protection. But, the, but as it were, then there are discussions ongoing. And I remember as early as 2006, I mean, uh, which is about 14 years ago, there was a very raging discussion and uh, I did a bit of research on whether these individuals can be protected. But as it were, then there has been a fear that when you shift the criteria from the political considerations, then how far do you, how elastic does that criteria become? Will it be stretched to breaking? And if it is stretched to breaking then, what becomes of the main individuals who then more often than not flee because then they are facing civil political uh, persecution? Would it mean that extending uh, protection to climate refugees then would uh, dilute the focus the individuals who are originally intended. So that's an ongoing discussion which has not crystallized into hard law as yet, at least as far as I know. But I mean, we have a large audience of lawyers here and perhaps somebody could have come across a development that I have not come across. But the last time I checked, that was the position. Thank you. Very interesting. This was a, a very interesting blog about this uh, climate refugees. I didn't uh, read yet this French Decision, maybe Pilar later <laughs> you post it to us uh, for those who are interested. Uh, this is uh, something really new and fascinating. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Luis, again for this uh, very fascinating question. Do you invent more of these uh, really uh, questions which get us forward? Very interesting. A talk this time. Uh, who is next? Do I see some more comments or questions? Uh, if there are no more uh, questions, uh, I think two hours is a very good format. Uh, so maybe uh, we come uh, to close it. Uh, I enjoyed it uh, very, very much. I personally, I learned a lot uh, of these different perspectives. And I think one aim we fulfilled, we brought you together. Uh, I think uh, such a small seminar, it's more seminar than a conference, uh, only is the top of the iceberg. We brought you together, you see you are investigating in three different contexts on three different continents. And maybe now that uh, we brought you together, uh, you continue uh, yeah, making stronger this uh, network we uh, begin to build. Uh, this is, is from my side. Very uh, great thanks to all the three speakers, uh, to Karin, uh, which co-organizes this uh, second talk, uh, to our student assistants who helped in the background. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. And maybe uh, the last word to close this event, I leave to uh, Caroline Herzog from Bayreuth. Uh, thank you very much to our wonderful public, uh, to the nice questions as well. And now I really give to the last work to Caroline Herzog. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sven. Um, Thank you, Sven. Actually, I wanted to, to make a short remark. Mm, I know that uh, Louis Gittin-Niva 
is uh, TGCL alumna. And I want, um, yeah, just to highlight that we had a presentation um, on our last talk about the migration and asylum um, law in the EU. So if this is of interest and for everyone who um, wasn't um, aware of this new talk series, we have all our presentation from the last uh, uh, session on our YouTube account, which is African Legal Studies. So you can watch this presentation online. And um, uh, with regard to climate ch um, change refugees, um, I would like to leave it open to you as participants. Please give us feedback if this is um, of great interest, then we should um, try to organize speakers, experts on this topic, and then we can um, make a special issue in one of our next talks. Right. Uh, otherwise, I wanted to encourage also our students, the students from Chile and the students from TGCL, the current student group, to ask questions. Um, if, if this is <laughs> yeah, too great public and you want to ask questions uh, later on, then please feel free to do so. We will try to share all presentations in the course of this or next week. And uh, yes, as I said, we would appreciate your feedback. We want to make it, um, yeah, we want to, to find relevant topics and uh, topics that affect uh, the three different continents that you were representing. Pila Moranga, thank you very much for this very insightful presentation with a lot of new information for me personally. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. Simon Schaub, uh, you're participating in such a great project and um, I'm so glad to hear. I think I would never heard about this project mm -hmm. when we hadn't have this talk. And uh, also to you, um, Omondi Robert Uvinu, thank you very much. I, I have already read some parts of your book, so I was aware of it, but it is always a very good yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It gives us more detailed information when you enter in such a discussion, and I think it was really of. Um, yeah, it was uh, benefiting all of us, and I hope you too. Yeah. So, in the name of uh, Toko Kaime, the TGCL project leader, who can't be here today, I should also convey his regards. I hope he's there next time, and. Um, yeah, in the name of the, on behalf of the whole team of TGCL, I would like to thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining you. us again. <laughs> bye. See you next time. Maybe it this will be you. about May. We want to do this more or less three times a year. Maybe about May will be the next edition. Thank you. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. <laughs>